Hi, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Tom Saunders. I'm president and CEO of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. The Conservancy, as you know, does land conservation work, watershed uh, conservation and restoration. Uh, we do urban forestry and other, other planting work. We own uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water and share it with the public. And uh, fortunately, we also have a wonderful program, uh, which is Pennsylvania's Natural Heritage Program. And we do that with a lot of good partners in that work, various state agencies. We're the large nonprofit that, uh, that manages um, much of the natural heritage work. Uh, our speaker today, David Yaney, is in our natural heritage program and he's one of our leading ornithologists. Uh, so David always is working on interesting projects, but part of what David brings to those projects also is a lot of innovative uh, work with technology. And that's a part of what we're going to hear about today. Uh, so, David, I'm looking forward to this presentation. I know it's a fascinating project, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. I will add the one comment that if people have questions during the discussion, feel free to type them into the Q&A feature, and we'll try to take some questions after you're done. So with that, David, I'll pass to you. Okay, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that introduction. So today we're talking about uh, Finch Superflight tracking winter movements of evening grosbeaks. And um, I would like to also just remind you that you can drop any of those questions in the Q&A and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the end. I'll try to leave enough time there to, to field as, as many of those questions as possible. So as Tom said, the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy is a diver diverse organization. We have a lot of different programs um, and we're a nonprofit that was established in 1932 and the first land trust in Pennsylvania, protecting over 260,000 acres. Um, as he said, I'm in the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program and the Natural Heritage Program is this partnership between the Conservancy, the Game Commission, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Fish and Boat Commission, um, and is a member program of NatureServe. And our job is to really gather and provide information on the location and the status of rare plants, animals, and natural communities. And the purpose of that is to inform environmental decisions and conservation uh, decisions as well. So today's project is, is also a, collab a collaboration um, that uh, I, I have to give a huge thanks to the partners involved in this specific uh, work, which uh, obviously it's a natural heritage program project, but we're also working closely with Carnegie Museum of Natural History and specifically the Powder Mill Avian Research Center. Uh, Luke DeGroat has been instrumental in this project. Also the Finch Research Network, uh, recently founded by Matt Young, and um, we've had some small funding from the Nuttall Ornithological Club. This project also falls under the umbrella of the Allegheny Bird Conservation Alliance, which is more of a Western Pennsylvania regional coalition of conservation groups focused on matters related to birds um, and their conservation. So now let's start talking about finches and the super flight and what is all this, and then we'll get into the specifics of the project with Evening Grow Speaks. So at the base level, we're talking about uh, a finch eruption. And this might be new to a lot of people, but uh, an eruption is when we have species that migrate in large numbers out of their typical range due to some uh, lack of a resource. So for birds, we typically talk about birds that are in the boreal range. So that's think of Northern uh, forests of Canada or the Arctic, and they're moving south in large numbers due to poor food availability. And in the East, we have um, eight different finches, uh, which are listed on this figure here, uh, and we'll get into them in a little bit more detail in a moment. But the important things to notice here is that these finches feed on specific seed crops from, from trees. We can talk about the cone crops from our, our conifers, our pines, our spruces, the fir trees, talk about deciduous tree seeds like those on birches or maples, and then fruits that are produced from um, shrubs such as mountain ash and other, other trees that are, that are fruit bearing. And so they're linked to the specific production cycles of these food, food um, items 
And when they crash or boom, uh, it affects the populations. And so, and so uh, you can see specifically for evening growth speak, there's also a tie to the spruce budworm, which is a native moth species um, that affects the, the balsam fir and spruce forests in the, the boreal range in Canada and drives that population as well. We'll get into some more details of that, but this is really to show you there's a, a huge link between this movement of birds and, and their food sources from tree seeds. Now in 1999, Ron Pittaway began what's known as the, the winter finch forecast. And he really looked at the production of these tree seed crops and was able to develop a way to essentially project whether or not there would be an eruption of finches from the boreal into Southern states, into the, the Northeast or even farther South. And that's become a really um, valuable tool in, um, in terms of, of expecting whether or not we'll see any of these birds within Pennsylvania. And birders uh, throughout the US and Canada often look forward to this. Now it's recently been taken over by the Finch Research Network and Tyler Hoare is heading up that, that project now. Now in terms of a finch superflight, that is when we have all eight of these Eastern finch species erupting within the same winter season. And this is a pretty special event that, that occurs not very frequently. And it's only been uh, well documented in the last 25 years, th three times as occurring, and maybe in the last 50 years, five to six times max. So this is a, uh, a unique event that happens. And it's when we see food, food shortages in a number of these uh, tree crops. And then we end up having a large flight of, of each of these birds, or maybe m large flights for some of the species, but certainly all species are on the move. So let's take a look at these players in this super flight. Uh, so who are some of these boreal finches? First, we'll start off with, with the red poles. You have the, the hoary red pole here, uh, which is more Arctic, it's far, farther north. Um, and then you have the common red pole. Both are very similar. The taxonomy is a little bit um, in question between these two, whether or not they're one species or two, but right now we recognize them still as two species. And this winter, we've seen the largest red pole eruption in over a decade, large numbers moving south. Of, of, of these species, um, and e even into Pennsylvania, large numbers. Also, we have um, that these red poles typically undergo a two-year cycle. They key in on uh, the seeds of birches, alders, willows, and then at your feeder, they're gonna love the, the Niger thistle seeds. Uh, we also had a huge eruption this year of pine siskin, which is a bird, uh, a finch species that breeds in Pennsylvania, but is also a species of special concern. Uh, as, a, as a breeding species, but we had a huge eruption of this species out of the boreal too, with uh, thousands being counted at hawk watch locations in the east. Um, they typically feed on grasses and forb seeds and eastern hemlock. Next we have our crossbills, and there's two crossbill species that, that we see in this eruption, uh, the white wing crossbill and the red crossbill. These are really unique birds in that their bills, the mandibles, are actually crossed and they're designed to help them pry open the conifer cones and extract seeds from those. Now the white wing crossbill typically key in on spruce, fir, tamarack, and hemlock cones, while the red crossbill um, will key in on a variety of pines depending on the geography. And an important point about the red crossbill is that it's a really highly diverse group with um, what used to be 10 call types, 10 distinct flight call types that um, researchers have identified to specific geographies and that the birds respond to those specific call types. Recently, one of those was elevated to uh, a full species, the Cassia crossbill, but now we have nine distinct call types within red crossbill. Next, we have the purple finch and the pine grosbeak. The pine grosbeak is our most northern of the eruptive finches, which means it rarely ever comes south of, of New York. We've had not many records in Pennsylvania over the years and none this year, but, um, but they are being seen in good numbers just north of us into New York. It, the species likes a variety of seeds and fruits like birch, birch catkins, apples, crab apples. And the purple finch is um, a, a species that looks maybe similar to one that you might see really commonly, the house finch, but there's a few uh, characteristics to help differentiate them. Um, with this kind of raspberry coloration going into the back and, and the wings and uh, lack of, of darker streaking on the flanks here. Um, but this is a bird that actually breeds in Pennsylvania, but also erupts from the boreal 
And they typically like to eat the, the buds and seeds of elms, tulip trees, maples, and um, will also feed on the uh, sunflower seeds at your bird feeder. And now we have the, the species that'll be the focus of this, the rest of this talk, which is the evening grosbeak. And um, here we have, uh, I wanted you to really get a good uh, up close look at what the male and females look like. Um, when we see these birds, there's uh, basically from an, a field observer, you're, you're only gonna be able to say it's a female or a male. Um, all the juveniles can't be identified unless you have a bird in your hand and can look at molt limits. So this year we're seeing the largest eruption of evening gross peaks in over 20 years, a massive movement out of the boreal forest. Um, and uh, we can talk a little bit more why in, in a moment. The evening gross beak, it was a species that was first described by science in 1825 from a specimen in Michigan. Um, but it has one Native American name called Pashkandamo, which means seed breaker. And this relates to their massive bills, um, which for, for its uh, English name, the gross beak, meaning comes from the French large beak. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's a prominent feature on this bird. The, bird, the bills will actually kind of be this bone coloration throughout the winter and then they'll start to turn almost a grass green as we get into spring and they get to their nesting season. Now this beak is, is very strong with ha having up to maybe 125 pounds of force um, that, that it can use to crush seeds. And we'll talk about what sort of seeds they're eating in a moment. Um, the name evening gross beak is actually uh, a misnomer. It was incorrectly first thought uh, near the time when it was described to only come out at night due to some of the observations that, that were made. Um, but this is, this is a, a diurnal bird. It's active during the daytime, migrates during the daytime, feeds during the daytime. Um, so it's, we have an interesting name for this bird, both for its uh, common name and its scientific name, which is uh, Cacathrostes vespertinus and the vespertinus referring to that evening uh, element as well. Now let's talk about the diet of evening gross beaks. Um, they, as I mentioned earlier, they, they actually have this really strong relationship with the, the, east, the, the spruce budworm. There are eastern and uh, western species of that, um, but here in the east, we have the eastern spruce budworm, and they use that as a primary food source during the breeding season to, to feed and raise their young. They also feed them a variety of beetles and aphids, and, and then when it comes to seeds, uh, you know, why, the, why they have that bill, they are... Um, you know, highly tied to, to maples, box elders, uh, tulip poplar, elm, and, and a number of pines they can feed on, as well as some of the, the fruit trees like um, cherries, crab apples, um, autumn olive, junipers. And then at your feeder, they're going to chow down on the black oil sunflower seeds. But, um, but so when we think of the fruit, those fruit trees, they're actually getting at the seeds. So if you think about uh, a black cherry pit, um, they're, they're getting into the stone of that and cracking that open. So that just is an example of the power of these massive bills that they have. Now let's talk about the distribution because there's an interesting history here with evening gross beak in the east. Historically, the evening gross beak was a western bird species um, found out here in, in the Rocky Mountains and farther west. Um, but it began an eastward expansion in the late 1800s and uh, was first noted in, in the East in, a, in the 1890s. And uh, that's when the winter eruptions began to occur as well. Then by the 1920s, the species was noted to breed here in the Northeast um, in New England states and Canada. And then we saw annual winter eruptions from about the 1960s until about 1990, the early 1990s. Um, when those begin to taper off. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, part of the reason for this eastward expansion, uh, reasons that are hypothesized are the plantings of box elder trees, um, which they have the same type of uh, Samara seeds that uh, ma our maple trees have. It's, it's, it is a, a tree that's in the maple family and, um, and the spruce budworm outbreaks and their population fluctuations. So. It's believed that perhaps there was this uh, quote unquote baited highway of plantations of box elder, 
moving from the west to the east and allowed the species to expand, but also these spruce budworm outbreaks that perhaps the species was taking advantage of those. We don't know for sure, and there's, there's research trying to figure that out. Something else that's interesting about the gross beaks is that they also have some distinct call types, and there are five recognized subspecies that, that kind of correlate with the call types. Um, it's not exactly linked um, yet, but there's research being done to further understand these. And so these have uh, call types that, that can be recognized individually and have unique spatial distributions. And so in the East, we have what's known as type three, and that's the nominate uh, species, subspecies, Cacothrostes vespertinus vespertinus. And that's, that's the, the species that we see here in Pennsylvania, or the, sorry, the call type that we see here in Pennsylvania. Um, though there's a lot of research being done this winter by the um, Finch Research Network to request recordings of these uh, gross beaks uh, to determine if there are any new call types showing up in, in new places, and, and there have been, especially in the West. Now, what does that sound like, and how, how do they actually tell these call types apart? Um, so here's some gross beak calls um, and other some of their, their flight calls and some of the other calls that they make uh, at the, our research site in Pennsylvania. But I also have the five call types shown here by their spectrograms, which is essentially the, the signature that the sound makes. And I want you to just notice that they, they each are unique, so they can be identified to that call type by an audio recording. Um, now let's talk about gross speaks in Pennsylvania. So they were basically regular winter, um, a regular wintering species um, through the first part of the last century and then really up until 1990s um, when we began to see a, a decline. And in 1994, they were actually first, con first confirmed breeding at several locations in Wyoming County out in eastern Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. And, um, and then we have some, some banding data that, uh, that ties to Powder Mill Avian Research Center, um, showing us kind of where these birds were moving during the times that they were able to band them. So this is um, data from the Powder Mill Avian Research Center for evening gross beaks that were banned, banded at their banding station out in Westmoreland County. And so we have points here that um, that show where these birds were essentially uh, recaught or um, observed in some other way. So these they're called banding returns, and and so uh, you can see quite the distribution throughout the northeast and even in the south when there were other eruptions. But if you look at the colors as you go from red to light yellow, and you can see the numbers. So this is the number of birds that that they had banding returns for. You know, 40 in the 1960s, 42 in the 70s. 17 in the 80s and only two in the 1990s did they get banding returns for, showing a pattern that is even more evident uh, when, when we start to look at the gross beak declines. Um, and so uh, here's that same powder mill data that has been put into a graph form and showing from, from the early 1960s all the way up into today, just how the number of gross beaks that they caught during the winter and banded at the banding station has, has plummeted. And so you can see it's only nine during the 2000s have been banded there versus a high of, of over 4,000 during the 1970s. So this also goes along with uh, a recent paper, 2019 study that was published. It was kind of big in the news, 3 billion birds lost in North America. So pointing out that we've actually lost about 30% of the total populations across all bird species in the US and Canada and, and why. It doesn't go into why so much, but, but, th but th that's something that we're all trying to figure out. Why are these birds declining? For boreal forest birds and evening gross speak in particular, it was the, the most steeply declining land bird with a 92% decline across its total population and, and a similar decline in just the Canadian Eastern boreal forest, and that's just since 1970. So we're talking about a 50 year period. And so the species uh, has gone under some uh, assessments and reviews and some of the threats that have been identified 
um, threats and other limiting factors include the fluctuations in those spruce budworm populations and whether or not they're being treated for by the, the, the forestry industry in Canada. Um, also the, the window and vehicle collisions, these birds can sometimes get, get uh, uh, killed in, in kind of mass by vehicles on the roads. They'll come down and they'll pick salt and grit off the road uh, to help with their digestion. Um, but also the loss of mature forest. They, they breed in immature balsam fir and spruce woodlands and forests in the Canadian boreal. And uh, the loss of that habitat is suspected as a, an, a potential cause. And then also climate change and just how that might impact some of those northern forests and their conifer, um, you know, conifer composition. So the species through this assessment was actually listed by Canada as a special concern species in 2016. And then the Partners in Flight Land Bird Conservation Plan from that same year um, actually featured the bird on its cover with its, uh, with its huge decline and cited that we needed to learn more about the breeding ecology, their eruptive movements and their eruptive migration and the factors that are driving their populations. So this is where our research comes in. So here's a look at, we're gonna to start to focus in on our research site, which is in Forest County, Pennsylvania. And it really began in 2007. Um, so this is, this is actually the site where I grew up. And in 2007, uh, I had a, if you build it, they will come moment for any of those of you who might be familiar with the Field of Dreams movie. Um, heard an evening grow speak fly over the yard and said to my dad, I was visiting for Christmas, said, you know, we should, we should build a platform feeder. They typically feed on platforms or hanging trays. And uh, I think we can get some gross beaks. Well, the next morning there were nine evening gross beaks in that platform feeder eating sunflower seeds. Pretty amazing. And that kind of started my tracking of these data points. And, uh, and so we see that the gross beaks have occurred in this area, which is in the Allegheny National Forest uh, in seven of the last 14 years and in the largest numbers and the most consistency of any location in Pennsylvania. And we can also look at over the most recent nine years, it's six, six out of the nine years. Um, so not even really following as much of a cyclical pattern, but just consistent eruption into this area. But so, so the question is why and how, what can we do to, to study this winter population that will help inform the conservation of the species overall? So we developed some research questions. First of all, you know, like I said, why do they consistently return to this area in Forest County, to the Allegheny National Forest regionally? Do they have some site fidelity, meaning do the same birds come back year after year? Um, how far do they roam within the region during the winter? Are they staying put? Is it the same flock we're seeing, you know, every day? Or are these different birds? What's the timing of that eruptive migration movement? And then where do these winter populations breed? Because a lot of conservation effort for habitat management really focuses on um, the breeding grounds, but if we can connect where they spend their winter, the routes they take during migration, and where they breed, then we can have even more um, impact on the habitat from a con from a, a, the conservation from a habitat management perspective. So this is where where we have um, modus coming into play, and I'm going to tell you what modus is. So modus is Latin for movement. So it's not an acronym or anything like that, but just for movement. And the modus wildlife tracking system um, is, is really this, this collaborative international network that is designed to track the movement of species, not just birds. Um, in this diagram, you can also see a butterfly. Uh, there are dragonflies that are tracked this way. And so what it is, is we have these tiny radio transmitters that weigh fractions of a gram up to a couple grams that can now be fastened to small songbirds. And, and then these, um, these tags, nano tags that are putting out the, the radio signals can be detected by antenna that are at a tracking station. So we have a network being established of these, these tracking stations, the receiver stations that can hear that radio signal that's unique to that particular tag on that particular bird. And when the bird flies past it within about 15 kilometers, um, then you are going to get a detection, hopefully, um, if everything's, if all the technology is working properly. So you can get detections across the network passively um, 
in a way that we've never been able to, to do this before. And so you can look at habitat use throughout the annual life cycle uh, of, of bird species. You can look at migration corridors um, for ecology, ecological studies. We can look at post-breeding movements, migration stopover use, um, winter habitat use, winter movements, um, timing and energetics. A lot of things can be answered using this. So it's, it's actually an, an, uh, building off of an old telemetry technology adapted in a new way into these tiny transmitters that, you know, the, the weight of the, the mass of the transmitter matters a lot in terms of what you can do with it because these birds are very lightweight um, and they can't hold a lot of weight. But at, at, with this advancement in technology, we can do a lot of very um, interesting new things. So here's a look at what the kind of Northeast network of active MODIS receiver stations is as of this past week. And so each yellow point represents an antenna station that can detect MODIS tags. And then the, the, um, the bubbles around it are basically their in pro projected antenna um, ranges and directions. So um, the, the, uh, the network has really been uh, built up over the last few years with a lot of work from Powder Mill Avian Research Center and the Willistown Conservation Trust and the, their development of the Northeast MODIS collaboration. So we've got a large number of detection stations within Pennsylvania. Uh, recently, there have been stations added to New York to catch birds flying um, basically in this Northeast to, to um, Southwest direction. Um, and then there are a lot around the lakes and, and into Canada more as well. And so for our specific study here for Evening Grosbeaks, we had um, placement of towers that would help us capture regional movements. And here's an example of our um, colleagues out at Powder Mill and putting up a pop-up pop tower. Sometimes these are located on fire towers. There's a couple in the Allegheny National Forest that are on fire towers. And, and so here's the, the research site um, in Marionville. And we've got five of these um, MODIS receiver stations across the region so that we could detect any movement throughout the forest. You can see that the dark green here, the, the half a million acres of Allegheny National Forest where these birds might be moving around. And so here's a look at, at the, uh, the research site, um, the research station with the pandemic, we have challenges. And so this work is all done outside um, the whole time. And we're, we're taking all the precautions that are necessary for, for keeping it safe. Um, there was a, a mini station. This is actually an antenna uh, that, that was put up by Powder Mill Avian Research Center, uh, right where we're doing the tagging. And so that that's, has a smaller range, but it's designed to pick up every bird with a tag on it that would come back to this location or come, come by it. Um, and will help us tell how much time birds are spending there, feeding, uh, a lot of interesting information that can be gained. So how are we actually doing this? What are the field methods? So um, we've got a couple of different techniques for trapping using this bow net, which you can see here, that's, that wor works a lot like a, uh, a targeted mist net. Um, and then potter cage traps, we do color banding for each individual so that um, in addition to the unique USGS metal leg band, we put a, a color combination on those birds so they can be identified by, by field observers. And, um, and then the tagging, we're using uh, a couple of different types of tags, which I'll show you in a, in a few minutes, but uh, nano tags and life tags using this leg loop harness. And I'll just wanna point out that we do all this work with approved federal and state permits. And we keep the bird's safety and health at, at, as a top priority throughout the entire process. As I said, it's all permitted by USGS and the state. And we follow these uh, strict ethics guidelines of the North American Banding Council and the Ornithological Council. Uh, there are strict limits on the transmitter mass. For these birds, it's about 3% of their body mass. So, so it's it's very, very small amount. Um, and it's basically equivalent to a, a fanny pack uh, for a human to, to be wearing. And uh, certainly throughout all, we, we just try to balance the conservation benefits of the tagging with any potential cost to, to individual birds. So what does this look like? Um, here's some photos showing the process of color banding. 
Um, and so you can see I'm putting a, a black plastic band on this, this bird's leg. Um, and then you can see another bird with a unique color combo um, with orange over yellow and nothing over the metal band. And so uh, by referring to the right or left leg of the bird, observers are able to identify individuals and report those back to us so we get even more detections of birds moving throughout the landscape. So the tagging, um, in this photo on the, the left here, you can see I'm, I'm putting on the leg loop harness on this female evening grosbeak, and then you've got two, two birds here. I'll, uh, I'll bring up the next photo. So here's three, the three different tags that we're, we're putting out. Um, the tags are sized according to the bird size. As I said, we, we are very careful about not putting something too heavy on these birds because they need to be able to fly strongly. And, uh, and so we've got the low-tech powered nano tag that has, that has a finite battery life. Uh, for these birds, they're they're fairly large, so they could hold they they actually can hold one of the larger sized um, nano tags with with batteries, and these would last you know more than a year, maybe up to two years. Um, now, but now we have even just with this year, we have basically the first deployments of some of these solar nano tags. Um, actually, I think this bird right here was one of the very first ones that had this transmitter put on it. You can see there's the solar panels that. It will, you know, absorb energy from from the sun, and then it, these low-tech solar nanotags have an onboard battery to store that. So we've also got the CTT Life tag, which is another solar-powered tag as well. Um, here's just a look at a couple birds that we tagged after they were released. Um, just kind of show what it, what it would look like to an observer if you saw one of these birds after the fact or at your feeder. Um, there is an antenna that extends down. It's, it's essentially like a thin whisker uh, that, that just hangs down, you know, behind the, the actual transmitter. And that transmitter sits basically, you know, on the lower back above the rump. So what are the results? So we've, we've been doing this study since uh, the winter of 2017. And so this is, uh, this was, um, as of this week, um, we, we actually uh, are the first and only project tracking evening gross beaks with transmitters. And we've banded almost 90 birds and deployed um, around 50 tags. Actually, th those numbers I, I just realized weren't exactly correct, but we've, we've got uh, 52 tagged birds at this point with a few more that were tagged this week and, uh, and color banded as well. So our goal, you know, we have, we have goals to put out more tags so that we can learn more about these species as uh, the species as they travel this winter and beyond. So we have some reciting results as well, which include those birds that are observed by birders at their bird feeders and reported back to us. So seven observers from six locations have reported 36 project birds. And that's, that's basically just from that 2018-19 season. And uh, I wanted to feature some of their photos here um, from another location in Marionville. There's actually one two birds that you can see color bands, a little green color band there and the antenna, thin, thin, thin antenna hanging down and then a little blue color band on that bird. Uh, this bird, you can't see the color bands, but you can see the antenna from, from also another place in Forest County. And then this, this was the big one, uh, a report from, from Saguenay, Quebec uh, of a bird that was tagged at a feeder um, in June. And so that's gonna, uh, that's gonna come back up here in a moment when I show you some of the tracking results. Um, so, so we had um, a number of detection locations, which included both the MODIS stations as well as the, um, the, the observer locations, people's feeders. And so uh, within, within the Allegheny National Forest region, we had 10 locations, which included half of those being MODIS and half of those being reciting locations. So you can see the, they're spread across. So, so birds were detected on all of those towers that, that were put up to, to detect them. Now looking at large scale detections, the number of locations where gross beaks were detected um, doubled. So we had 20 detection locations and half of those were, were in Canada. So that's, that's really, really valuable information that's gonna show us a lot more about these eruptive movements and, and help us understand the paths that they're taking and where they're ending up for breeding. So 
in terms of the number of birds that we had detected, and I'll just, I should say that this is all preliminary because we're still in the middle of the study, but these are some of the results off of primarily that 2018-19 season where we deployed 18 nanotags. So we had, but we had 35 evening growth speeds because there were a number of birds that were color banded, but not, not nanotagged. Uh, 35 evening growth speaks were detected and we had 10 of those growth speaks tagged uh, via MODIS that were detected. And what we saw, and I've kind of exploded these points because they were all on top of each other otherwise, to show you that there's just, there's a large number of, of movements within the Allegheny National Forest, meaning that the birds are, are moving around, uh, probably finding different feeding stations, different uh, tree seed crops that, that they can eat. And so a lot of, uh, you know, within the region, lo localized movements. And so speaking of those local movements, um, I want to take a look at four, four specific um, tag birds that, that we had that showed us um, both local movements as well as large scale movements. So we had uh, these three birds, 517, 360, 6, and uh, 357. And so they were all tagged here at Marionville, but detected across the five stations and, uh, and an observer location in, in the Allegheny National Forest. Um, this was, you know, during the winter season, um, uh, and, and I'll focus on this number 517 because that's the one that gives us one of the most detailed tracks. And so it was in the Allegheny National Forest, Marionville area. From, from the 2nd of March to being detected, it was actually tagged in late February until the 11th of May. And so once we expand this out, we see this this on the 11th of May, it decided it's, it's time to go back to the breeding ground. So, so essentially we, we, we suspect it went around Lake Erie, uh, just wasn't, there weren't towers maybe to detect it, um, but probably around Lake Erie, around Lake Ontario, and made it up to this location in Canada, in Ontario, um, by, by May 12th. And then um, by um, May 26th, made it up to, to this location in Quebec. And so what we can also see is for these three other birds, which we didn't have, and maybe it's because uh, they didn't fly where they could be detected, or maybe there weren't motor stations to detect them. Um, but three, the three other birds also ended up in the Saguenay, uh, Quebec area by early June. And so we have these, these four birds in, in a relatively close area of, of um, you know, Quebec near the Saguenay, Saguenay um, Quebec, uh, region and and so it's starting to show us a little bit about you know where are our winter populations connected to and we're looking forward to more data coming in from birds that have been tagged this year but also interestingly enough is that um, and this is from from Tyler Hoare at the uh, Finch Research Network spruce budworm outbreaks uh, occurring right right within that area where these birds are heading to so again tying together in a spatial way a link to to where there's a specific outbreak of the spruce budworm. And this is information that we hope, you know, we can provide for uh, conservation measures. So some of our early conclusions. As I said, we're beginning to see this link between the Western Pennsylvania winter growth speak populations to the Saguenay, Quebec region. And that'll be interesting to look at in more detail as we collect more data. And seeing the importance of the spruce budworm play out in our tracking uh, uh, results so far with active outbreaks that, um, that may be influencing the, the birds that we're seeing here in, in the Allegheny National Forest. Um, we also saw this high flock turnover at feeding stations. So I pointed out that, um, that inter-regional or intra-regional movement um, across the Allegheny National Forest. And so we might see, you know, at a feeder, at the, at, the, at the research site, we might see a flock of 50, and then we might see a flock of 30. Well, by just observing them, um, we don't know if those are the same birds, or those 30 of the same 50 or not. But when we start putting color bands, and we start putting the tags on, then we can see that, oh, those aren't the same birds returning. This flock has no, no tagged birds. There's no tag detections. There's no color bands. So we know that there's actually a much larger population um, moving around within the region than we would have known had we not been doing this project. Um, we're also beginning to look a little bit at the, the timing of the migration to their, you know, back to their breeding grounds, look, looking at this March to May area um, timeframe, which 
which is is in line with kind of some other studies that that have been done. And then looking at their migration route, we have one fairly detailed route that that shows this pattern of lake avoidance, which we've seen from some citizen science data put into eBird. But now we have a specific individual that we can we can show actually took this route to avoid the lakes. And that could be important for conservation of the species as well. So what are our next steps? So, uh, so for this year, uh, as long as these birds are still here, we're gonna try to deploy more, more of these nano tags, more of the solar tags in particular, because those solar tags, uh, I didn't mention, but they, but they could last the life of the bird. So the oldest, uh, oldest record for evening gross peak, I think is 15 years, but you know, these birds might live seven, eight, 10 years. Um, and so we have the potential to collect uh, many years of data off of these birds with these solar tags, which is really exciting. So we've got this long-term data collection potential. And then with more data collection, we hope to look at some landscape competition, co composition and um, landscape use variables in a spatial way uh, to look at these important eruption sites. And then the ultimate goal, as I've said several times, is to provide new information for conservation strategies um, when hopefully there will be a conservation plan developed for the species. And, that, and that's likely gonna be you know, done through a combination of, of breeding and wintering uh, migration stopover type um, conservation information. So uh, with all of that, I, I wanna just kind of thank everyone for, for attending today. And you might be wondering, how can you help? Um, how could you get involved with this project? Um, so first of all, we, we say thank you to our, our WPC members for your support and, um, and your support of our organization and this, this work that we're doing to conserve habitats and species. And if you're not a member, we encourage you, uh, you know, you can go to waterlandlife.org and you can join online if you'd like to support this work or more work like it. Um, also, if you're, you're a bird enthusiast, which I, I guess you might be because you're listening to this, um, look for evening gross peaks at your feeders this winter. And if you happen to see a bird with, with tags or color bands, please take a photo, uh, write down some notes and, and email it to us. We'd, we'd really love to have that information as well. Um, beyond that, we also have a gross peaks in motion shirt sale that we've been running for a couple months now. Um, we have this wonderful design by Code 5 Design that um, we put on some t-shirts and hoodies and this, the shirt sales are going directly to help this project, to, to buy more nano tags, to help us uh, you know, with some of the costs of this research. And you can, you can buy those at the website as well, waterlandlife.org um, slash buy grow speak shirts. And so with that, uh, I will take any questions. David, thank you for the great presentation. That was really interesting. And I'll introduce Nicole Walsh, who is also with us and who is going to organize and um, and uh, sort of MC some questions and answers. I saw we had some great questions. Yeah, we have a, a lot of questions. So if um, okay. <laughs> we don't get through all of them, uh, we will attempt to answer through email or you can always um, send an email to David and he can get Absolutely. back to you. Yep. Okay, so um, one of the, the biggest questions or the most frequently asked was about the transmitters. And um, there was concern about, uh, do they break off? Do they get tangled up in trees and shrubs? Um, do they increase any vulnerability uh, to predation? And also, um, does it interfere with mating? Right, yeah, that's all, a, lot, a lot of points there. Um, so uh, the best way to answer this, so, so like I said, we, we definitely balance the cost of uh, the potential cost, because I'll say there, there haven't been a lot of studies that actually show that there are um, huge negative impacts. Um, but there have been some studies that show some negative impacts to, to birds with transmitters. But we weigh the cost of that to an individual versus the knowledge to be gained for the conservation of the species. And um, furthermore, it's information that you know, can't be collected through citizen science efforts alone. We can't know these specific migration routes or even if it's the same birds occupying an area. So the value to conserve a species that's declined its total population by over 90% by understanding how individuals move is, is very high. 
Um, so the, the transmitters, like I said, they're about 3% of the body mass. And so uh, literally for, for, from a person of my size, that's, that's essentially like a less than a, less than five pounds in a fanny pack to carry around. It's not that it's nothing, but the birds, uh, you know, they, they fly strong. Um, any bird that would show a sign of it's not handling the transmitter or that it, you know, cause they're wild animals. So they can individuals and different species can respond in different ways. Uh, that transmitter doesn't get deployed on that bird. So we take the bird's health very seriously. And like I said, we follow very strict guidelines. Um, there's, uh, you know, some species specific information that's been shown more in uh, larger birds, water birds, um, passerines, not as much on in terms of the, uh, the impacts. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of it's species specific and, and nobody's done it yet on these birds. And we're getting a lot of tracking information back just from the small number of birds we've deployed. So, so that's a really good sign that the birds are doing well with the transmitters. Okay, have these MODIS studies been expanded to species other than the evening grosbeak? Yes, oh yeah, yeah. Um, excuse me, there, there have been, you know, there's been, I don't know the exact number of, of nanotags that have been deployed, but it's, it's thousands and hundreds of bird species probably. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, a lot of it's focused on migration stopover. Uh, there's some breeding habitat um, studies being done as well. We, we actually have another project looking at Swainson thrush breeding habitat that we've, we've done in the Natural Heritage Program. So there's, yeah, there's a, a diversity of, of species that, uh, that this has been done with, but but ours is the only project that's working with even gross beaks, which is pretty interesting because it's a species that's declined so much, and usually there's a lot of focused attention on on uh, species that decline uh, significantly like that. Uh, what's the average lifespan of the gross beaks? Is that known? Oh yeah, the, I wish I had that off the top of my head. I'll have to get back to you on on the the average, but like I said, the the maximum that that I've read in the literature is is 15 years. I would imagine it's a bit, quite a bit less than that for the average, but I can answer that in email if you want to email me. Okay. Um, has there been a decline across all the types of the gross beak populations or more so with types one through three in the boreal? Right, so the declines aren't exactly tied to the types as far as what I've seen, but, um, but yeah, there have been declines across um, all the regions that Partners in Flight has, has looked at um, with, with varying degrees, but but the uh, the Canadian Eastern Boreal Zone has been, you know, one of the highest at like ninety two percent, matching the overall decline. Okay. Um, the solar tags, how long do they last? I think you covered that. Yeah, the life of the bird. So as as long as the the tag stays functional, um, and the tag isn't destroyed or damaged, and the bird is alive and moving. And it's getting sunlight, and at least at some portion, it's going to be able to, to um, you know, transmit data to those receiver stations. Uh, is there a site in Erie County, or was the dot in Crawford or Warren County? Do you recall? Uh, dot for for which for the? Um, I'm not sure if it was one of the the sightings or not. It's um, not specified. Yeah, so we didn't have any, this is the, um, a map with, with uh, the tracking locations, uh, sorry, the detection locations as the circles and then these four tracks. Um, you know, we didn't have any sites that were in uh, Erie or Crawford for this project. Okay. Um, what is the correlation between the budworm outbreak and winter eruptions? Did the birds do really well during the breeding season, but not during the fall and winter? Yeah, that, that's a great question, right? So. So for this year in particular, because we're seeing, like I said, numbers in more than 20 years that we haven't seen this far south, um, gross beaks have, have even reached down into Florida and Georgia, which is really far south. And a lot of the thinking is because of um, three, three substantial spruce budworm outbreaks in Eastern Canada that were not treated due to the pandemic. Um, so they were not treated with pesticides. Um, the spruce budworm is a native species, but it can be very damaging for the, uh, the timber uh, tree species that, that we'd be harvesting. And so areas were either not treated or not treated as much. And so it's suspected that they had a really big boom uh, population this, this summer. 
uh, combined with the, the, the shortage of their tree seeds, um, which kind of made this perfect uh, storm for them to, to erupt south in the huge numbers we see. Okay, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, have you had any birds show up further south this year? We've had up to 100 at our feeders in Garrett County, but haven't looked them up closely enough to see the Keller bands or antenna. So no, I, I really don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a lot of information right now on the birds that we've, we've tagged um, this winter other than a few local observers. And I've at least been able to see that, you know, a number of the birds have, have been detected on, on some of the receiver uh, stations that, where we had data uh, uploaded. That's one point. The MODIS data has to kind of be manually pulled for most of these receiver stations. They're remote. So it's, it's like on an SD card and you have to upload it to the site. And there are um, people throughout the network that are taking care of each individual station. Um, so yeah, it could be possible that you could see some. I mean, we don't, not a lot has been studied about their these eruptive movements, so that's why we're doing this because we just we just don't know if they might just stay regionally and kind of move around within the region, or do some of these birds kind of then pop out and, and move farther. Um, is there a, any correlation between the initial logging of old growth boreal forests and species decline? Oh, that's a good question. I I don't know. I mean, I know that it's more so that that you know the species. Evening grow speaks nest in, in mature or second growth uh, boreal forest and, and woodlands. So I, I, that's, that's a good question. That's probably something that should be looked at. Um, this came up a couple times. What's the difference between a finch and a grow speak? Okay. And are the other winter finches declining in numbers as high as the grow speaks? Okay, so a couple parts there. So. So all of the birds that we talked about today, those eight species, they're all within the finch family. Um, so they're all in, this, in the same taxonomic family. Um, some of them have gross beak names, but they're also finches. That, but yeah, so, so yes, a gross beak is a finch, but it's, it's uh, you know, a different species than the purple finch, you know, than those other eight species, those other seven species. And the other part was, are they declining? Are the other species declining as, as much, and that's the answer is no, they're not. You know, the gross peak is, is declining in, in uh, kind of some unparalleled numbers. Okay. Uh, is there a website where the MODIS data are posted and available for the general public? Yeah, absolutely, uh, modis.org. Yep, nice can, and simple. <laughs> yep, yep you, can, you can view those uh, receiver stations. You can click on them, get some information. You can even, uh, some of the tracks of the birds are publicly viewable um, that you can see, and you know uh, more information is available with uh, with credentials. But uh, yeah, there's certainly a lot that you can see just at the public view. You mentioned the the platform feeder. Um, what are the other ways to attract or help the birds on their migration? Yeah, yeah. So Gross Speaks, um, they they will feed basically, uh, you know, because their their bills are huge, so they don't really like the tube feeders, you know, reaching into these slots on tubes. Uh, they don't really, they don't eat the thistle seeds because their bills are too big. So they, they really key on black oil sunflower seeds and you can even uh, the striped sun, sunflower seeds, but in a hanging tray or a platform a hopper style feeder, that's kind of the house, house shaped feeders that some people have. Um, and then also on the ground they'll feed. So, so those are all the ways that you might be able to, uh, you know, get them to come to your feeding station. Um, there's a couple questions about lake avoidance. Um, what's the thought behind why they aren't crossing the Great Lakes? Yeah, that's that's interesting. I might have to get back to you a little bit more on that one. Um, but I, I all I know is that that there some species don't don't want to fly over large bodies of water because that's that's how they've evolved. And so it might it might be something to do with that. You know that it's a risk that they're not going to take. So for them, it's more. Um, advantageous to, to circumnavigate those. Um, I'll look into that a little bit more. If, if you want to give me an email on that one, I'd be happy to, okay. to dig into that one more. Okay. Um, I think we should probably wrap it up. There, there's a, a lot more questions I think we can probably get to uh, answering individually. Okay. But um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending today. Um, we do these uh, 
semi-annual uh, webinars. So keep an eye on our website um, for upcoming ones. And thank you very much, David. It was really interesting. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thanks, I'm happy to talk about this. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks.